How many of us, when we go to someone's home, we walk in, we make ourselves at home so much so that we throw our trash on the floor, we clean our wet, muddy shoes on their towels, and we go right to the fridge and we get food out? We don't do that. (laughs) Because there's unspoken rules of boundaries. When we go to a store, at least for most of us anyway, we don't go grab stuff in the store, open it up, open the package up, and just start using it right there. We pay for it. We purchase it. Why? (laughs) That's right. (laughs) I had to do that once because my blood sugar had tanked so bad. Yeah. (laughs) But the reason why we don't walk out of the store, not pay, we got to purchase it. We purchase it. And when you've purchased it, whatever that thing is, especially the, the more it costs, when you've purchased it, you have an expectation of how that thing's going to be used. You have an expectation of, of how it's going to be used, when it's going to be used, and typically it's going to be according to your rules. And in the Western culture, we don't like anyone telling us what we can and we cannot do. We're very individualistic. So much so that we live in a relativistic culture. It kind of came to, you know, what's right for you is right for you, what's right for me, right for me, and I can't tell you how to live and you can't tell me how to live. We also live in a culture that very much would say this, and we've heard this, don't tell me what I can do with my body. Don't tell me what I cannot do with my body because it's my body. In our text this morning, we're gonna see that Paul he redefines that thought. He actually speaks against it. As believers in Christ, our bodies are not our own. We have been bought with a high, high price. As believers, God resides within us. His spirit is within us. He dwells within us. He's taken up residency within us. As individuals that are united together with other believers that the same God resides within within it's an interesting thing to think we are called into a higher standard one that honors God one that serves God so I want to read our passage 1 Corinthians 6 9 to 20 and it says this don't you realize and catch how many times Paul uses this phrase actually throughout his letter quite a bit and he really starts it in this chapter He says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheap people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. Some translations say I should not, become a ma- I should not be mastered by anything. You say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. And this is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you cannot say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us up from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize... That if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. For the scriptures say the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And then he says run, or, or really the better word is flee, from sexual sin, sexual immorality. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. Don't, you don't belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. <clears throat> Verses 9 to 11 in our passage, our, our transition from the previous passage into this one. <clears throat> 
that we're looking at today. And in verses 9 to 10, 9 through 11, Paul is calling the Corinthian believers into a new mindset. He's trying to get them to think as believers ought to think. He's wanting them to act as believers ought to act. So not just in thinking, but it also should show up in how they do, what they do, in their actions. And Paul's not saying in those verses, he's not saying if you commit one of these sins, you're going to lose your salvation. That's not what he's trying to get at. What he is saying is that as believers, we're no longer to act in these ways. We're no longer to indulge in sexual sin or worship idols, commit adultery, male prostitutes, homosexuality, thieves, greedy people, being greedy, drunkards, abusive, or cheat. We're not to act in that way. Instead, we are called to be holy as God is holy, as he says in 1 Peter uh, 1.16. And you and I as believers are urged to live lives that are pleasing to God, lives that reflect God's holiness. And in verse 11 of our passage, Paul says this. He says, some of you were once like that. You, some of you once were found in those sins. That's who you were. It was your identity. But you were cleansed. You've been washed clean. You were made holy. You've been sanctified. You've been set apart unto God. You were made right with God. You've been made righteous with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul's trying to get them to think about their lives in a different way now. To get their thinkings from being Corinthianized, if you will, living as the Corinthian people lived, because in their culture, most everything was free to go in those things. Go do those things. But instead, what he wants them to do is to live as Christians, Christ followers, people that would reflect Jesus, his holiness, who he is. In the Corinthian culture, the list of sin that Paul mentions there in verses 9 and 10, uh, those sins were pretty commonplace in that day. The Corinthian culture was a very promiscuous culture, kind of like ours is. The sexual promiscuity, very common thing. And it, because of the temple of Aphrodite uh, <clears throat> was in Corinth, prostitute, prostitution was very common. It was a culture of free sex. Does that sound familiar? One of the common mindsets of the day was that your body and your soul were not really connected together. The soul was important. The body was just a vessel of no importance. It was something that would just be done away with at death. And this is what Paul's referring to in the next set of verses, in verses 12 to 14, because he wants to redirect their false thinking towards what is true, that our bodies, our bodies do matter. What we do with this fleshly body matters. How we treat it matters. He says this, he says in verse 12, he says, you say I am allowed to do anything. Some say that I'm, uh, well, anyway, it says, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. Even though I'm allowed to do everything, he says, but I must not become a slave to anything. You say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. That's true. So someday God will do away with both of them, but you can't say, you cannot say that your, our bodies were made for sexual immorality because they were made for the Lord and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise up from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. <clears throat> Twice, Paul says this phrase, I'm allowed to do anything. And that was, the, it's kind of understood that that was their mindset. That was the thinking of the day that, you know, as believers, we have freedom here. We can do whatever we want because we've been given grace. And some of the people in the Corinthian church, they believed that as a truth. Why? Not totally sure. But that seemed to be a common phrase in the day. And the thought is that possibly, as Corinthian believers, they misinterpreted what Paul talked about, what he meant when he said that we have freedom in Christ. Romans 6 kind of tends, lends towards that because it says, should we sin all the more so that we can gain all the more grace? And he says, no. Listen to Paul's rebuttal to this misunderstanding of their freedom in Christ. 
They said this. They said, I'm allowed to do anything. They were using it as an excuse to live as they pleased. And Paul's response to that was simply this. It was, yeah, but not everything is good for you. Yes, you may have freedoms, but some of those freedoms, they have a time and they have a place. It did, it, it did not mean for them that once you're saved, once you've been given God's grace, that sin is no longer sin. It still has an impact. It still has a very grievous act. It's very a very grievous, grievous act. <clears throat> and just a few verses earlier, like I said a second ago, Paul lists out sins. So it's not like sins have been done away with. He still mentions that there are sins that are running rampant, and there's sins that still run rampant in the church, but you've been cleansed. You're no longer to act like that because you've been called holy. You're a saint now. You've been washed clean. You've been made right with God, and that's not how a believer acts and lives. The Bible does not record every sin, and there are a lot of recorded don't do's in the Bible for sure, But James defines sin one step farther. He says, in James 4.17, he says, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. And Paul says a second time, he says, I'm allowed to do anything. And he takes his response even one step farther to them. He says, I must not even become a slave to anything. I must not be mastered by anything. And there are freedoms that we have that are not sins that can very easily become sin. When is that? When we become a slave to them. Or as other translations say, when we become mastered by them, when they become, when they take over and and they become what we are and what we do. There are things as Christians that we have freedoms in, but we must understand that those freedoms may not be beneficial and they may actually take us captive. It's easy to look at our freedoms as those are our freedoms and think they only affect us, but that's also not true. I have often found that believers that focus on their freedoms usually tend to lean towards a selfish lifestyle of faith and are often blinded by how they are mastered by less obvious sins. They gossip, but we do it under the disguise of a prayer request. They hold bitterness, but under the disguise of I've forgiven them with a... But, man, I'm expecting some healthy dose of justice upon them. Or they lust, but it's okay because they live under this disguise of, I am, I, I'm just admiring what God has made, and I'm not going to act upon it. <clears throat> or they withhold money from God, disguising it with, I'll use whatever I buy for God's work. Or I don't like the direction the church is going, so I'm going to withhold my money from them. Our freedoms in Christ are not meant for our gratification as much as they are meant to glorify Christ. In in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, he will talk more about what that really means about our freedoms in Christ. He'll explain it more. As believers, like I said, we're free in Christ. Paul says that in Galatians 5.1. That means we have been freed from the penalty and the power of sin and death. We no longer are under the law because it points what out. The law is meant to point out what is wrong. It's point out, it's to, it's to show us how not to act, but also how to act. And the law, when it's left to itself, condemns. We no longer, like I said, are under the law because it points out what is wrong. So that means we can now freely live as we choose, right? And that's kind of their mindset. And Paul says, not at all. Romans 6, 1 to 2 says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? And he says, or, you know, we, you and I, we've died to sin, so why live according to what is dead within us? Why run back to that? Galatians 5.13 says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another. 
So we're, we're to use our freedoms to serve one another. In other words, our freedom is not meant for our pleasures, our freedom in Christ. Our freedom in Christ is meant really to benefit others. Romans 6, 17 to 18 also says, Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you, are whole, you wholeheartedly obey this teaching that we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you've become slaves to righteous living. Our freedom is not meant for sinful, self-gratifying living, but for living in a way that's righteous, that's right in God's eyes, that honors God, that makes much of him and less of us. In verses 13 and 14 of our passage, Paul is showing them how ridiculous their thinking is here. <clears throat> he says, food in the stomach, food and stomach only have a purpose in this life. But those are necessities for this life too. I mean, if we don't eat, what happens, right? You die. And if you eat the wrong foods, you die. Without food, the nourishment and the well-being of our body plummets. Those are just physical needs of today. Sex is not a physical need. That, actually, I remember hearing, listening to somebody as a, uh, um, a psychologist once that was making a comment about how, especially in the context of teens and young adults, that, that they need to go have sex because that is a physical need that they have. So they need to have the freedom to be able to express themselves in that way. It is not like food. That's Paul's point. It is, it's totally different because food has a place and sex has a place. <clears throat> sex, our bodies are not meant for sexual immorality. It has a, a time, a frame that it's supposed to be built within. It's a gift given for the right time and place from God to us. And the, de- the Bible defines that boundary within marriage. The word used in our passage here that Paul uses for sexual immorality is actually a very general word. It's the word pornea, which we get our word in English as pornography. But that word was meant to be general in that it defines any sexual activity outside of marriage. Outside of biblical marriage. Our sexuality was made to be used in the right place and at the right time, not in an immoral way. So how does verse 14 fit into this? Where Paul says, and God will raise us from the dead by his power just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Why does he say that right there? Because he's going to expound upon this in chapter 15. As I said earlier, the Corinthians believed that they had this freedom in Christ, their mantra was allowed, what was this? It was, I'm allowed to do anything be- because we have freedom. Because my soul is going to be saved, but my body is just going to stay in the grave. It's just, it's nothing. This is, this is a tomb that I walk around in on a regular basis. That was their mindset. And Paul wants to flip their thinking on its head by saying that, no, your body is important to God too because God's gonna raise it up just as he raised up Christ's body. He wants to redeem it. He wants to restore it. When Jesus came back, Jesus had a glorified body. His disciples saw him. They saw the body. If you remember, Thomas touched him, the holes, and saw the holes. Jesus had a glorified body. And God's gonna do the same for us. We'll see that as we get into 1 Corinthians 15. And God takes concern not only for how we think, but how we use these bodies, what we do with them. We will see that, uh, and God will resurrect and he will redeem our physical bodies. I've said that. We don't fully understand what that looks like either. We have an idea. But it does give us this understanding that God died so that we will not only think godly with our heads, but that we will live out physically godly lives using this physical realm as tools for honoring God. We are much more than just a soul. 
In verses 15 to 17, Paul takes this argument of our bodies and the use of them for God's honor. He takes it even a step further. Paul wants the Corinthian believers to think of how unthinkable it is to defile our bodies. Os Guinness, a commentator, said this. He said, this, this one flesh relationship in marriage is the ideal that judges all the rest of Christian sexual ethics in scriptures. That is what is behind every prohibition in this area. Why would not men sleep with animals? Why is adultery wrong? Why are homosexual practices wrong? Why is premarital intercourse wrong? Simply because there is no true oneness and therefore there should be no one flesh either. And that is precisely what Paul is arguing here, he says. The point is not that some Corinthian Christian was sleeping with a prostitute. Chapter 5, there was incest between a man and a stepmother. Now it's that they're, they're, they're sexual intercourse, they're just having, it's free sex, it's prostitution, sex with prostitutes because that's their culture. And he said, and that is precisely what Paul's arguing, that the, the point is not some Corinthian Christian was sleeping with a prostitute. Paul could have just as easily have said this, he says. He who joins himself to the good-looking housewife down the street, or she who joins himself to the good-looking athlete down the stairs. He says he... Because in Corinth, it was men who tended to have double standards. And he says prostitute because in, the, in Corinth, that was the particular problem. But the true problem was that there was intimacy without intention. And there was communion without commitment. <clears throat> in Genesis 2.24 says this. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Paul is referring here to God's design for a marriage union. In Matthew 19, 5 to 6, it says this. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they're no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. And then in Hebrews 13.4, it says this, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. The NASB says it this way, the marriage bed is not to be defiled or is to be undefiled. And then it goes on, it says, God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. I think Paul, part of what Paul's getting at here is a couple things. He's speaking of the marriage union. He's lifting it up. But he's also talking about how the two become one, flesh, and how that is not meant to be in any other place but the marriage. Sex is a gift. It has a place, like I've said, just as fire when it's in the fireplace is beneficial and good, but as soon as the fire gets out of that fireplace, it wreaks havoc. It causes damage. Paul alludes to sex being designed by God in what he says. And then in, in other passages, we see that too. And God is the designer, is the one that defines where, when, and how it is good and where, when, and how it is bad. Some common objections to God's command against sexual immorality are these, and I've heard all these actually over, over the years. It's not wrong if we love one another. Sex within marriage is blessed, but sex outside of marriage is considered fornication, adultery, it's sin. That's clear in Scripture. Some other objections I've heard of this. You know, times have changed. The Bible's outdated. And what was wrong in biblical times is no longer considered sin. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday as today as he is in the future. He has a plan. And many of the passages where sexual immorality is mentioned, because they try and take that one out as that's no longer really a sin, it's not a problem, but then all the other sins that are typically mentioned right next to sexual immorality in Scripture, we still consider them bad today. Another, um, another objection I've heard to marriage and, and going... According to God's 
direction is we're married in God's eyes already. And the Bible, which is interesting, often uses the image of a wedding and a covenant image as a metaphor to teach the spiritual truth. Because I do believe that God holds up marriage, he holds up the wedding and a covenant, covenantal marriage, as something extremely important. He's given us the picture of what it looks like. And anytime sex is, happens outside of the marriage, it's considered fornication, it's considered idolatry, it's considered immorality, or it's usually connected to idolatry. Another one of those objections is I can still have a good relationship with God because he understands. He understands what I'm feeling my needs. We fool ourselves to think that God's just going to overlook sin. We lose the fellowship of God in our lives and our fellowship with other believers often begins to break down. Sex is more than just a physical act. It involves the physical, the emotional, the cognitive, and spiritual parts of our entire being. And as verse 18 points out, or points towards, it actually has an extremely deep impact, so much so that it's the only sin that is said to be a sin against our own body. Sexual immorality is the only sin that unites two people as one flesh. And as one commentator said, it's, it's a sin that corrupts and ensla- ensnares like no other. <clears throat> and we can get into the depths of how it unites two people, but for time's sake, I don't really want to get there. I don't want to go there. But I will say this. Sexual sin has a lasting impact upon not just the person, but an entire society. When sex becomes a freedom to be used outside marriage and society gives it that right, what ends up happening is this. The degradation of women, you become objects and tools of whatever, and then there's a division between men and women that becomes even greater than what has already, is already there, and the family unit breaks down, and because a family unit breaks down, society gets weakened. I remember listening to a, uh, a lecture about the downfall of Rome, and it was interesting because one of the, the things that they equated to the, the downfall of Rome, one of the contributing factors was their freedom of sexuality. They said that was one of, the, one of the main reasons why Rome went from being a great power to basically being a nation that had no power. Verses 1920 are the point that Paul wants to make in all this, though. <laughs> He's using a pretty clear picture that sexual immorality is an issue. Sexual immorality is a big issue. And wants us to understand that our bodies are meant for God's glory. Because he says this in 19 and 20. He says, run from sexual sin, flee it. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. And then he says, don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? When we come to know Christ, God's Spirit comes and resides within us. Would we take God to a place of immorality? Is that where God wants to be? Is there a conflict between God and immorality? And if God is in us and we're taking him to a place of immorality, whatever that could be, I mean, you can extrapolate this beyond sexual issues to greed, to cheating people, to the list of sins in in verses 9 and 10. It grieves the Holy Spirit. It breaks our fellowship with God. It doesn't mean we lose salvation, but God's a gentleman and he lets us go and he, he'll let us sin. But it breaks down our relationship with him in the sense of our fellowship, of being able to hear him. Our prayers get hindered. 
And what Paul wants us to understand is we are God's temple. You and I, our bodies are the temple of God because if God's spirit is within us, we are the temple of God. And we're not going to treat the temple of God, we're not going to defile the temple of God. That's not what we want to do because we don't belong to ourselves. Because Christ paid a high price. <clears throat> and so Paul, the, the truth that Paul wants to get across is just simply this. In whatever you do, and however you act, and however you live, you must honor God with your body. Acknowledge God with your body. Give him the best with your body. Do what is right with your body. And we can run that out to all kinds of different areas. We could talk about living healthy lives. We could talk about you know, sleep habits. We could talk about eating habits. We could talk about all kinds of stuff. So you must honor God with your body. I'm just getting in right there actually (laughs) I do want to say this though because I don't want to I don't want to leave this is a very practical scripture I think because Paul is talking about sexuality, sexual immorality, and that as believers that we are one with God, and there is a rampant problem in America. We have, I mean, it, it, and it's everywhere. Pornography is in our face. And I'm not going to pretend like pornography is just a guy issue. It's not. It's a female issue, too. It can run in different streams. Guys, it tends to be more of the visual. Girls, it tends to be more of the emotional, the reading, the books, whatever, the, the love story types. If you are struggling with that, if you're struggling with the sin of pornography in some way, shape, or form, I would challenge you guys to read through this passage multiple times over and choose this phrase, you must honor God with your body. And I would also choose, I would also say this, Paul makes it very clear, he says something, he says, he doesn't say, hey, you know what, just continue on in what you're doing, but he says flee, and that word flee there, typically the idea is you're running away from, you are turning and running 180 degrees, running at full steam ahead away from that issue but there are other scriptures that really come to talk about how there's freedom there's there's there can be healing there can be when we confess sin to one another there's an accountability that's there there's a healing when when you come to another brother or sister in the lord who there's maturity there by the way that can pray for you and pray with you there can be a healing that can begin to happen So if you're struggling with pornography or if you're struggling with a sexual sin of some sort, feel free to come talk to me. I've been down that road. And uh, when it's not spoken, it has more power over you than you will imagine. When When you confess it, it's amazing what can begin to break down in your life in the in the sense of that sin. Um because that's another form of how we're not honoring God with our body. So anyway, let me pray, and then uh, uh, I'll just let the Spirit of God work on you guys, and however he needs to with this passage. <clears throat> Father, um, you've given us a lot of freedom, but there are things that have a time and a place. May we be wise in how we use the gifts that you've given us. May we understand that when they're not used in their proper context, they are sin. <clears throat>
they, uh, and there are some sins that have more impact than others. No sin put you on the cross more than another sin, but, but simply God just, there are sins that do have more impact upon us. Lord, break the chains. I pray if there is sexual sin in this room, Lord, you will, have break, you will break the chains. Lord, I pray for those that aren't sure what to do with it, that you would give them ability to go to another brother or a sister in Christ to walk through that together. Lord, for those that don't even know if they can find healing maybe from sexual sin in some way, shape, or form, I pray, Lord, that they would understand that in Christ, just as it says in verse 12, that they've been cleansed. They've been made right with God. Lord, as Psalms speaks of, our sin is as far as the east is from the west. You see us through the blood of Christ. We've been bought. We've been, we've been bought with the price of your blood, Jesus. We've been cleansed by it. And God, how you see us is you see us through the lens of Christ because of what he did on the cross for us. You see us as righteous. You see us as holy. Lord, may we walk in those steps. May we, may we use our body in that way. May we honor you. May we, we take this temple and use it as a sacrifice to you, God, to, to bring the glory and the honor to you that you rightfully deserve. <clears throat> so go with us as, uh, as we leave um, and be honored in what we, what we do. In your son's name, amen.